Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Snappers, you know we love some ear hustle over here at Snap Judgment. It's the show created by people and stories from San Quentin State Penitentiary, a short drive from Snap Studios. They are Snap family. And they just launched their eighth season. Their first episode focuses on the events of August 21st, 1971. The date marks the deadliest day in San Quentin history. And it's still a painful topic, centering around one man whom you may not be familiar with. George Jackson. But George's legacy, just like George's stories, refused to be forgotten. I'm John Yahya Johnson, co-producer of the Ear Hustle podcast and campaign coordinator for the Repeal California Three Strikes Law Coalition. The following episode of Ear Hustle includes strong language and mentions of violence and suicide. Discretion is advised. One day I let a friend of mine read an article. And so he brought the article back. And, you know, I threw it on my bed and walked out to chow. And it just so happened that the tear officer went in my cell, did a cell search and read the article. And on the front of the article, it had a picture of George, right? And when I was in chow, somebody came and told me like, hey, Ken, you got like 15 officers at your cell. And when I walked back up to my cell, they cuffed me and put yellow tape on the outside of my cell and took me to administrative segregation. In 2007, Kenneth Oliver was in prison at California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. The article he left on his bed had a picture of George Jackson on its cover. When George Jackson was incarcerated in California in the 1960s, he wrote the books Blood in My Eye and Solidad Brother. He died violently in San Quentin on August 21st, 1971. So I'm like, well, what are you taking me to administrative segregation for? I haven't done anything. And they said, well, you know, you're not supposed to be having reading material like this. And I said, reading material like what? They said, well, we saw this article, and then we saw you had this book, uh, Solidad Brother and Blood in My Eye, and, you know, what are you doing with this? I said, I've had these books for 10 years, ever since I've been in prison. And y'all let it through R&R, and I never knew it was a problem with it. And he said, well, you know, we've been told to get rid of you. What do you mean, get rid of me? And he said, they want you to go to the shoe forever. It wasn't forever, but Kenneth ended up spending over eight years in the security housing unit, the whole, because of George Jackson. How are you scared of somebody has been dead for 40, 50 years? I mean, George Jackson must have been the most powerful cat on earth for you 40-something years later to be so scared that somebody reads a paragraph that he wrote, that you're willing to neutralize that person forever because you're so scared that you might wake up the George Jackson in me. Today on the show, 50 years after George Jackson's death at San Quentin, we pick up that question, what was and what still is so dangerous about George Jackson? I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Erlon Woods. And this is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Do you remember the first time you heard about George Jackson? Yeah, I I was in a youth authority Mm -hmm. and I read one of his books, but it seemed kind of academic to me at the time, like like way beyond my comprehension. But it was still a book circulating in the youth authority. I mean, who gave it to you and what made you think you even wanted to read it in the first place? Well, I got the book from a dude named Poindexter. (laughs) Oh my God, a perfect name. Yeah, that that was his handle. I mean, he was smart as hell, glasses and all. And Mm -hmm. he recommended it and he was like, man, this is something you want to read. Right. What about you, Naj? 
Um, I'd heard of George Jackson growing up, but it was just another one of those like crazy 1970s stories, you know? For me, it was up there with the Mansons and Patty Hearst and the Weather Underground. I heard about it, but I really didn't understand all the details. But I'll say this, though. The man looms large in San Quentin. He's part of the knowledge. When we started this podcast, Nige, I knew eventually we had to do a story about George Jackson. But... This is a super sensitive subject for people who work in corrections in California. We were all nervous about how CDCR would respond to the idea. And they weren't thrilled at all. Mm -mm. George Jackson is a red flag, even today. CDCR thinks of him as a troublemaker, a thug, a killer. But some guys inside think of him as a role model, a righteous dude, a great thinker who was targeted by California prison officials. And there's no bridging the two sides on this one. Nope. To this day, The name George Jackson is a source of tension in California prisons. Oh man, it sure is, both for COs and incarcerated people. I mean, I've noticed when you ask people about it, Erlon, this weird vibe comes over the room. I remember you would never, ever, ever see a George Jackson book in this cover. Oh really? Nah, but they were in there and they do get passed around. Sometimes guys would take a hardbound book and just put a different cover on it. Or they'll photocopy the book and then carry it around like a notebook or something. Always a workaround. Yep. Ken Oliver, the guy we heard from earlier, first heard of George Jackson when he was a young man in California State Prison, Sacramento. A guy in the cell next to his passed him a copy of Solid Dad Brother. I think reading Solid Dad Brother was the first time that I was moved spiritually and emotionally, viscerally, by reading a book. The first thing that he taught me was how to be unapologetic about who you were. I just remember learning so much about history and, and, and the revelation that was occurring in my mind about why I was sitting in a solitary confinement cell at 19 years old. Some of the things that, that led to that trajectory that I never knew because I was just in it. The man woke up a lot of guys inside when he was living and long after he died. And even though his books are not officially banned, George Jackson is still a painful thorn in the side of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. To explain how he became such a divisive figure, we need to get into a little bit of history. So, Erlon, you want to kick this off? George Jackson was born in Chicago in 1941. In his book, Solidad Brother, he writes, My family knew very little of my real life. In effect, I lived two lives, the one with my mama and sisters and the thing on the streets. Jackson writes about getting picked up by the police a couple of times for mugging, and he ran away from home a lot. So in an effort to keep George out of trouble, his father moved the family out to L.A. in 1956. But L.A. didn't keep me out of trouble, Nige. Mm -mm. And it didn't work for George either. Nope. Like you, he ended up in California Youth Authority. Then in 1961, when he was 18, he was arrested and sentenced to one year to life for an armed robbery of $70 from a gas station. One year to life. Mm. That's what's called an indeterminate sentence. Kept guys in prison for long periods of time. And George was no exception to this bullshit practice. He got written up 47 times, and those were used against him every time he went up for parole. His sentence just kept getting longer and longer. But while he was getting himself in trouble... Jackson was also educating himself mentally and physically. He became a serious student of martial arts. He just be, you know, showing all kind of punches and kicks and side kicks and all that. Then he had all these magazines, martial arts and stuff like that. This is John Clouchet. He and George Jackson were incarcerated together at Soledad Prison in 1969, before Jackson had written his books and become famous. He didn't you used to sell with his son? I did. But I didn't know his dad. Mm -hmm. I finally met him last year in the transitional house he was living in. He'd only been out a couple of years. He told me that back in Soledad, he and George used to spar with each other out on the yard. Matter of fact, he used to use me as a punching bag, too. Uh, (laughs) I didn't know it a shot. I'm thinking I'm learning learning some martial arts. (laughs) You know what I mean? No, 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 no. But, uh, shit, I'd be all beat up and hurt up. And uh, I used to tell him, say, hey, wait a minute, man, wait a minute. When am I going to get a chance to, to do some punching? <laughs> 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 but, uh, 
Jackson was also getting deep into politics and political philosophy, reading books by Marx, Lenin, Mao, and Trotsky. And he was examining America through their eyes. I'm convinced that fascism exists in this country. This is from a recording of Jackson made by a journalist who interviewed him inside in 1971. The impressions that we get from uh, the movies and from the propaganda system that fascism is a, is a period of doors being kicked down and people being gunned down in concentration camps, that's just a transitory uh, period of uh, fascism. Once it's established itself, it's not necessary for the fascists to maintain themselves any longer with the uh, out-and-out brutal force. George became a communist, a left-wing, radical revolutionary. Which wasn't that uncommon. I mean, it was the late 60s and you had the Vietnam War raging. Black power groups like the Black Panthers were getting national attention. And you had white leftist radical groups like the Weather Underground. I mean, Erlon, it was just a very revolutionary time. Right. And George was talking about all this stuff to John Clouchette and other guys at Soledad. They talk about all these these revolutionaries from Germany and Russia and all this. Man, I, I couldn't even pronounce their names or half the words in the books he wanted me to read. So I take the book back and I look and I say, brother, I can't understand what's going on in this book. He say, well, take the Russia out of it. Put the, put the, uh, the Los Angeles in it and the California in it and the, and the police over here and Long Beach in it. And basically, you notice it's the same things going on. It's just in a different place. So that way, it was a lot easier for me to understand. Soon Jackson and other guys at Soledad were conducting political education classes, first on the sly and then out in the open. And he was really being like a conduit, Mm -hmm. you know, like bringing all these revolutionary ideas into the prison. Yeah. I mean, he wanted to wake people up in there. Right. Show them that their incarceration wasn't an accident. Because to Jackson... You couldn't understand prison without understanding things like racism, capitalism, and fascism. Fascism destroys a sense of community among the lower classes. And then the upper classes have a great community of interest. We have to establish a community interest of our own from the bottom. John Clouchette wasn't just getting schooled by George Jackson in martial arts. You got drilled on everything. You can't say I just read it and, uh, <laughs> and there's no thing somebody go ain't going to drill you on it. Because we were all trying to educate ourselves because some brothers had been educated, some hadn't been educated. Don't forget, we come from them schools in Watts and stuff, and they weren't the best schools in the world. But uh, we were always just trying to be better people when we came home. You understand what I'm saying? Better blacks, though. We want to be an uh, asset to our communities when we went home. I, I believe in the commune, the idea of the central city communes. And uh, through the communes, uh, as we fill in vacuums that the power elite or the governing elite and the upper classes have, uh, have left, as we fill in these vacuums and give people something to hold, something to defend. He was too adamant about us not having separation, and that would make him being separated from this brother over here that want to be this, or this brother over here that want to be that. You understand? So if he had ever said that, well, I'm a BGF, you're not going to listen to him if you're a Crip, or you're a blood, or, or you know, are you a Muslim? And I never heard him do any of that. Solidarity is still the same thing. As a people, we're supposed to be accountable for one another. We are not acting individually inside the the prisons here. We're all together. And uh, we have perfect discipline. And we have uh, rank and file. So that's a bit of the background on George Jackson and what he believed. Now we've got to get into the complex and controversial story of what happened in San Quentin 50 years ago. And we've called on an ear hustle friend who has helped us before with San Quentin history, Lee Jaspar. By 1970, tensions in California's prisons were boiling over. Racial division between black incarcerated people and mostly white correctional officers often led to violence. Nine guards and 24 incarcerated people were killed from 1970 to 1971. In 1970, in Soledad Prison, three black incarcerated people 
were shot to death in a racial riot thought to have been instigated by prison staff. A correctional officer was then killed apparently in retaliation. A few days later, George Jackson and two incarcerated people were charged in connection with the murder of that CO. Jackson and his co-defendants became known as the Soledad Brothers. Their case became a rallying cry for leftist celebrities and intellectuals like Marlon Brando, Angela Davis, and Noam Chomsky. Later that year, Soledad Brothers, a collection of Jackson's prison letters, was published. It was a literary sensation. Jackson was becoming an international icon of the struggle of black freedom and revolution. The Soledad brothers were transferred from Soledad to San Quentin to be closer to the trial in San Francisco. In August of 1970, George Jackson's younger brother Jonathan took hostages at the courthouse near San Quentin in an apparent attempt to force Jackson's release from prison. Jonathan was shot and killed outside the courthouse by California corrections officers. A judge and two incarcerated people were also killed. At San Quentin, the Soledad brothers were housed in the Adjustment Center. That's the prison's maximum security unit. Jackson had been at San Quentin before, but the Adjustment Center is a completely different world. And E, every time I go inside San Quentin, I walk by that building. I mean, You know, it's on the left and it's got that scary Gothic font that says Adjustment Center. And man, you know, serious stuff happens in there. Yeah, it's hella isolated. If you go to the AC, it's a wrap. It's the black hole. Mm. Once you're in there, you gone. Inside the AC back in 1971, the antagonism between convicts and COs was rough. When we return, we take a trip inside the Adjustment Center when the Ear Hustle Spotlight, August 21st, 1971, continues. Stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread, that's right. An organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf. To rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients. And plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread amplified. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a mental health professional in your pocket. Talkspace offers both therapy and psychiatry, and being able to reach out to a provider anytime, anywhere, makes addressing mental health super easy, and getting started is the most important part. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code JUDGMENT to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's JUDGMENT and Talkspace. Dot com. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Ear Hustle Spotlight, August 21st, 1971. Sensitive listeners, please note, this story does contain graphic imagery and explicit content. Discretion is advised. Today, we join the Ear Hustle team as they take us back to the early 70s inside San Quentin State Prison, where revolutionary George Jackson has been taken from the main line and sent to the AC, the Adjustment Center, the whole. Word soon got out in the general population at San Quentin that George Jackson was in the AC. He used to come out, he used to bring him out of AC. And they would tell us not to salute him. Gerard Trent Jr. was in San Quentin when George Jackson got there. And he's back there now. New York and I brought him into the studio. And saluting him was a closed fist above your head. A closed fist above your head, he said. Trent had throat cancer, which is why his voice sounds so strained. But we did it anyway. 
That's right. Because he earned that. That's the very least we could do. Was there punishment for doing that? For saluting him? No. 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 There's, there's power in numbers. And it was an awful lot of people doing that. Awful lot of people. Meanwhile, a lot of the staff felt threatened by the Soledad brothers. Most of the people that I worked with realized that these guys wanted to kill us. <laughs> Robert Ayers was a young guard at San Quentin. You still had to deal with them, but all the time you knew that if they had half a chance, they would kill you. You know, he thought himself a revolutionary and a political prisoner, but to me, he was a killer. In 1971, Ayers had only been on the job about three years after doing a stint in Vietnam. This was right in the middle of, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get the term right, but I'm going to say uh, an awakening of black awareness among the inmate population. You saw a lot more black inmates talking politically, okay, as opposed to shucking and jiving on a yard and talking this, talking that, you know, a lot more political dialogue. And again, this was kind of confusing because nobody really knew how to, how to take this. Is this, you know, what's going on here? Is this serious? Shucking and jiving, Nige? I think we call that chopping it up today. Yeah. In any case, George Jackson spent an entire year at San Quentin in the Adjustment Center. The Soledad Brothers case dragged on through a lot of changing judges, changing venues, you know, all this pretrial stuff. Finally, the trial was about to begin. Then came August 21st, 1971. There's a lot of debate about what happened in the Adjustment Center that day, but the prison's official account goes something like this, and it's a wild story. A lawyer working with George Jackson smuggled a gun to him during a visit. When Jackson was searched on his way back into the AC, a guard spotted something in Jackson's hair. George then allegedly put a gun out of what the guard said was a wig and pointed it at him. He then made them unlock the cells of 25 others on AC's first tier. Then, mayhem. Guys started grabbing guards, tying them up, and dragging them into cells. John Clouchette had just returned to the AC from a visit with his lawyer. At that time, uh, George said something. I don't know. He went down the tier. He was just kind of walking back and forth and just, he wasn't, you know, you know, he was like, you know how you be in a zone. He was just kind of just shaking his head like this back and forth. So I go back in the back and I see the guards, some of them tied up back there. And uh, they'd been stripped down to their drawers and stuff. And uh, I think they thought all of them were dead, but they weren't. Three guards were killed. Their throats were slit, and two of them were also shot. Two incarcerated people also died after their throats were cut. Three other guards also had their throats cut, but survived. It has never been determined who committed which acts of violence. The incarcerated guys on the first tier were in control of that part of the adjustment center for about 30 minutes. No, I hear somebody banging on the glass. Clack, 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 clack. Clack, 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 clack. And then uh, it just got real quiet because we know it was somebody outside. And uh, next thing I know, uh, the door bangs open. I don't know if they opened somebody, opened it from the outside or somebody opened it from the inside. Because I think I kind of like stepped back in my cell. And uh, the door bang open. George goes out the building. That was it. Nobody knows why George Jackson left the Adjustment Center. Nobody knows what he was thinking when he ran across the yard. 
Officials say he was trying to escape. He made it about 30 yards before he was shot and killed by a guard. He was 29 years old. Dick Nelson, a guard at San Quentin, was off duty that day. But he lived nearby and he rushed down when he heard that something was happening at the adjustment center. He grabbed a submachine gun from the armory, went to the yard right outside the AC, and started firing into it. Next thing I know, they come in there with a machine gun, a 45 caliber machine gun, who's got the shooting up the building. Uh, somebody told me them holes are still in there. They left all them holes still in the walls and stuff. Nelson didn't hit anyone, but the show of force did bring an end to the AC Rebellion. It was the most violent incident in the long history of San Quentin State Prison. Today, the gun Dick Nelson used is in the little museum just inside the San Quentin Gate. A gun battle occurred in the yard at San Quentin Prison in Marin County today. Three guards and three prisoners were killed in the disturbances, including George Jackson. There is a general lockup throughout the institution. Prisoners have been fed in their cells. Tomorrow, there will be no visitors at San Quentin. The institution is described as quiet but tense. So much about this story is strange. I mean, if Jackson was making an escape attempt, it was pretty ill thought out. It's impossible to escape. I mean, there are those 30-foot walls, and he'd have to run for a while out in the complete open. Right. And... The bigger question is, how did the gun get in there? Mm -hmm. I know they said that he brought it in in a wig, but I'm not quite sure about it. Yeah, I mean, to this day, there is no definitive proof of a lot of things. We just don't know what happened in there. And there are a lot of theories. There are definitely Jackson supporters who think he was set up, eliminated. CDCR folks say, no way. And people who knew Jackson have long speculated about what really happened that day and what led him to leave the AC. Some people say he ran out, you know, because he know if he didn't go out there, they was going to come in and kill all of us. And uh, it was a combination of a lot of things probably going on in his head. I could only uh, guess. I saw such a, a dramatic change in his personality after Jonathan had got killed. Remember, Jonathan was George Jackson's younger brother. I don't know if you could call it guilt or, or whatever. He just, he, he didn't hardly talk anymore. Or he used to sit up and lecture and stuff for hours and hours. He, he didn't do that anymore. He just kind of became kind of sullen. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say he was trying to commit suicide, which, you know, I guess you all of us was trying to commit suicide when you're in the devil's house and fight with his children. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. After Dick Nelson shot up the AC with the machine gun, the guards quickly took back control. And then there were consequences. We had all of us getting naked one by one and back out. Everybody was backing out there, beating us with guns, rifles and shit, beating us with gun uh, butts and stuff, handcuffing us, shackling us. They got it like that, and they pulling the chains up with all that. We was like that for hours, like, you know, until you just, your body just went numb. You, you, had, you had to let your brain go numb because your body was hurting so bad. August 24, I remember that day, and I remember it clearly. It wasn't just the guys in the adjustment center who felt the rage of the guards. Watani Steiner was in general population that day. We were on the upper yard. You know, I don't know if I heard the shot first or the whistle, because it was whistle that was that was blowing. Everybody had to get down, get down on the ground. And it was just like guards running wild around there. They racing down there, and, and the rest of them was on the gun tower, and they making sure nobody get up, threatening to shoot people if they move and stuff. Everybody trying to figure out what was going on on the yard. Then people started yelling, man, you know what happened? So what do you remember uh, that the day was like when George Jackson was killed? It was living hell. It was living hell. Gerard Trent Jr. again. This was the month of August. And usually for August, it's usually pretty warm outside. 
But for some reason that day, it was very, very cold. They had us buck naked and spread eagle on the upper yard for about four and a half hours. The police went in to the gym and got duffel bags of baseball bats and passed them out. And if you raise your head up to look, you might have got hit, and some did. It was a very, very chilling day. And it's the only time. It's the only time in my life I've ever asked God to let me die. To kill me. Because I could hear people screaming. They was the people who decided maybe they was going to look up. Robert Ayers, the young San Quentin guard, wasn't scheduled to go in the day after the killings, but he did anyway. I went in the next day. Uh, Sunday morning. Why did you feel compelled to go in? Because it had to be done. I was not the only one who took it upon themselves to come in. Nobody got called in. They just all came in. The institution needed help. What were the emotions you were going in with? Anger, sadness, confusion, um, violence towards staff. It, it wasn't like it was infrequent, but nothing to that magnitude. And you know, and, and I, I think there were there was a, a sense at the time. What the hell is going on? What just happened? What what have we experienced here? But what mm-hmm. do you think you were you were experiencing? What 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 was going on? Um I thought we were experiencing a part of the a revolution. I really do. I'm going to tell you something here and uh, uh, I don't think many people want to talk about it, but in the, probably the week after August 21st, the aftermath, we did some things I'm not really proud of, okay? I, I, I'm not talking necessarily about beating people up. But we took out our anger and rage on everybody. Everybody. This is how bad it was, okay? Um, I went in Sunday and I did some miscellaneous things Sunday. Monday, we started searching the East Block. And the word was standardize it. This is when they go to your cell and bust you down to regulated property, meaning they basically take everything but your boxers and your state issue stuff. Guys often end up losing a lot of personal stuff in the process. And anybody that complained about being standardized was unceremoniously hauled over and thrown into ad seg. For what? We didn't have to have a reason. They were an inmate. They were at San Quentin and staff died, and you're going to pay. One has a hard time coming to grips with the level of anger, frustration in the aftermath of something like that. It, it, it's, it's really, you know, for me, was an awakening experience. Mm. Wait, what changed in you? Well... Um, 
my mentality came together that, okay, we say we're the good guys and you're the bad guys, okay? And if we're the good guys, why are we doing bad stuff to you? I mean, it doesn't compute when you really think about it. When we return, we take a trip back inside San Quentin, present day. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. My name is Glenn Washington, and you're listening to the Ear Hustle Spotlight, August 21st, 1971. And sensitive listeners should note, this story does contain graphic imagery and explicit content. Discretion is advised. When last we left, the Ear Hustle team dove into the events of the deadliest day inside San Quentin State Prison. And now, we're taking a trip back to present day. So we are in the Peace Officer Memorial here at San Quentin that memorializes all the staff members who lost their life and a line of duty here at the prison. Just as you walk into the prison, when you look to the right, you see our chapel complex. When you look to the left, there's the adjustment center. And just before the adjustment center, uh, a few steps in is our memorial plaza. This is where we are. A little while back, New York and I met Lieutenant Sam Robinson at the officer's memorial. Fourteen correctional officers who died in the line of duty are memorialized here, including the three that were killed when the adjustment center was overtaken back in 1971. You have Sergeant J.P. Graham, who was murdered on August 21st, 1971. Correctional Officer P.W. Krasnus, who was murdered on August 21st, 1971. Correctional Officer F.P. De Leon, who was also murdered on August 21st of 1971. Nearby, there are other reminders of how that day changed San Quentin. Sam pointed to the Adjustment Center, just a few feet away. When I began here, there would be window panes that were missing. And the idea was is they were strategically placed all throughout the building. And you're trained early on that if something bad took place on the tier. If someone got out of their restraints and were attempting to take over the facility, that your first responsibility was to take your keys and drop them out the window. And so you would be on the tier with no way to exit the tier that you were on. But it also compartmentalized the area. And ultimately, the idea was to prevent what happened in 1971 from happening on the day that you were there. You may have given up your life. Your partner may have given up their lives, but you were isolating the incident right there. So basically, you are locking yourself in there with no way to get out. Exactly. Yeah. There was people whose, whose blood was spilled on these tears. The guys who we memorialize here in the memorial today, um, their blood was shed on those tears. And so uh, there's a I want to find the right word for it. There's a, um, there's a lore that's, that's in that building, um, that's in that place that um, you have respect for. Sam, why do you think that 50 years later, the story still brings up so much emotion for people? I mean, it's half a century ago. From the peace officer side, um, I don't think that we feel that justice was served. In the aftermath of the Adjustment Center incident, six of the incarcerated men who had been on the first tier were charged with assault in the murder of those three COs and also of Frank Lynn and Ronald Kane, the two incarcerated men who were killed that day. When the trial ended, Five years later, 
Only one person was found guilty of murder. Two others were found guilty of the lesser charges, and three were acquitted. The lawyer who was supposed to have brought the gun into George Jackson was charged too. He fled the country and didn't face trial until 1986. He was also acquitted. And so, um, I think 50 years later, 25 years later, right after the trial, people who worked here at the place, who ate with these people, who walked the line with these people, uh, who developed friendships with these people, who grieved with their families, uh, who tried to take care of their children afterward. Um, justice wasn't served for them. I feel like you, you're still carrying a lot of the weight from it, almost as if you were there. I'll tell you this, man. When you work in a place that has a history, right, and then you have this shared experience with the people, you walk those tears, and you have people who are assaulting you, and you have people who are threatening your life, there's a weight that goes along with that. Uh, when you look out the building and you see the memorial and you see the names of people who gave their life in a line of duty and you're in that same place where uh, the same potential is there, uh, there's a weight that goes along with that. I understand what Lieutenant Robinson is saying. And, you know, I sympathize with it. I, I actually sympathize with all sides of this right. totally messed up situation. I mean, what do you think, E? I, you know, I understand his point, you know, as a peace officer. But I've talked to people that were incarcerated in the 60s, mm -hmm. and they said the atmosphere was as racist as it was in society. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, officers could kill black people with impunity which was basically what happened back at Soledad Prison that set all these events in motion. Mm -hmm. So black people in prison felt that basically they was at war with white prison guards, you know? Mm, right, I'm right. not justifying it, but that's probably how they felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. So as you make a slight right turn... We asked Sam to point out another spot, well, just about 60 yards away from the memorial, around the corner of the chapel. The uh, just before the road starts to decline in elevation, George Jackson was gunned down uh, right about this area here. This is where we walk every time we come into the prison to go down to the yard, so I can't even count how many times I've walked by here. So the location where George was killed, incarcerated people can't walk that way because it's out of bounds, you know. Mm -hmm. But every now and again, I'd be escorted that way, going up to the chapel or something. I used to always think that this is the spot where George was killed, you know. Because mm -hmm. I remember seeing the picture of him laid out with his hand up. Right, and there's nothing marking that spot. Nah. But guys inside have their own way of keeping that memory of the day alive. Black August. Black August. I've been hearing about it for years, but Erlon, I don't really know that much about it. Well, Black August is a time when a certain number of Black guys inside fast, they study, they exercise, and they have discussion groups about politics and things like that. Hmm. And sometimes, if they can get away with it, they wear Black armbands. You know, and for them 31 days, it was all about education. This is Paul Redd. He did 45 years in prison. You have a book, a journal, and you make entries on what you're doing. So the next day, you might take it a little farther. So you're stretching yourself. Say you may read five pages a day. The next day, you might jack it up to 10. You always try to push yourself. It was about us making ourselves better when you come out of August than what you was when you went into it. That was the whole thing. There was usually schedules, like written schedules, like this is what we do. We'd have our exercise routine wrote down. We'd have study periods wrote down. This is Ken Oliver again, the guy we heard at the beginning of the episode who was sent to the hole because guards found George Jackson books in his cell. We'd have spread time or break fast. You know, so there was a whole, like, protocol, so to speak. And, I mean, it wasn't extremely strict, but it was guidelines, basically, that would kind of dictate what we were going to do from August 1st all the way through the end of the month. 
We would do political readings. We would fast all day. We would exercise and do burpees in the heat, you know, hundreds of burpees. And, you know, you'd be ready to pass out. And then, you know, everybody would get together at night when, when it was available to it or at the end of the day and cook and, and break bread with each other. To me, that was life-changing. To me, that was always magical. Guy started observing Black August in the late 70s. But over time, prison officials started seeing it as a threat. So they started to clamp down on it and punished anyone obviously participating. Now when you wear a black armband, they want to lock you up in a hole. When you go to the child house, all these officers in there, they're looking to see if you eating. They're looking to see if you observing Black August. And people realize man, you don't need to prove to them that you doing Black August because Black August is not for them. It's for you. So I can go into a child house and grab that tray. That don't mean I'm going to eat that tray and not go over there and dump it. A lot of people did, did do that. Lieutenant Robinson says at least when he was working in the Adjustment Center at San Quentin, COs had to be extra vigilant when August rolled around. 25 years after the incident, all the way up until recent times, um, Black August was something that staff had to be aware of here at the prison because there were people who, um, in the name of George Jackson, in the name of the cause, would attempt to harm people here in this building. I spent three or four summers in there myself, right, with my staff on alert, with my staff getting assaulted, years removed from that day because people were still honoring George Jackson, I guess, or the cause with violence. Um, I don't know what type of cause that is. I don't know what you get from that. For Paul Red, though, Black August was never about violence towards officers. It was a, a bogus myth that correction officer was to get killed during August. And it wasn't about that. It was about us internalizing, educating ourselves, making ourselves better when you come out of August, better than what you was when you went into it. That was the whole thing. So, Erlon, George Jackson led to Black August, mm -hmm. and CDCR does not have a lot of tolerance for either one of them. Any sign of either can be seen as gang activity. So this is why guys ended up in the hole for having Jackson books. But CDCR has had to bend a little. Paul Red did over 30 years in the shoe. Jackson material was part of what kept him in there for so long. But eventually, he got out, partly because of a hunger strike and a lawsuit he was party to. And Ken Oliver, the guy who was sent to the hole for having George Jackson material, he also sued and got some money. Ken Oliver and Paul Red are both out of prison now. We wanted to know how people in San Quentin do or don't remember George Jackson today. So we sent our inside guys, New York and Rashid, out to the yard. Who's George Jackson? <laughs> I was a brother, man. I was one of the comrades, man. Old school, solid ass brothers in all the business, man, who was locked up in San Quentin State Prison. They knocked him down, man, 1971, Black August, man. Do you know who George Jackson is? Oh, for sure. Big George. I understand what those brothers fought for and what they did. Who's George Jackson? I don't know, matter of fact. I'm going to say a president. Who's George Jackson, man? Uh, the Jeffersons. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, George, didn't George Jackson smuggle in a firearm and shoot some people? Yeah, he had it sitting on the top of his head. What does the name George Jackson mean to you? George Jackson stands up for black people's rights. Survival in the community, getting people together to do other things than crime. He was eloquent, you know, to be so young. You know, I, I've never read a book where I had to go, you know, pick up a dictionary to understand some of the stuff he was saying. I'm going to throw a name out. George Jackson. George Jackson? A fighter. He is Judas and the Black. Yeah. Who we talking about is Judas, bro? No, no, that's the movie that was portrayed on George Jackson. Man. I thought that was Fred Hampton. Oh, yeah, well, see, I'm wrong. Oh, my God. <laughs> One of them, brother. Yeah. Well, Erlon, it's a real mixed bag. 
Some guys knew about him, and obviously some guys didn't. Yeah, it's a trip because, you know, in my time, um, I didn't know too many people that didn't know about George Jackson. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He was just, he was prison lore, you know? But if Jackson's memory is going to survive inside, it's going to be because of guys like this. My name is Prince. I've been incarcerated for four years now at San Quentin for two years. How old are you, man? I'm 21. 21 years old. You're 21 years old. Yeah. Okay, you probably not going to know the answer to this then. Who was George Jackson? George Jackson was incarcerated at San Quentin in 1970, and he died in 1971. <laughs> yeah, so much for that. 1970 was before he was born. How do you know about George Jackson? I mean, because I grew up in a pro-black house, and George Jackson is like somebody like for history, black history. When we mention black history, you got to mention George Jackson. Prince told them about a conversation he had with some COs up near the Adjustment Center. And I was just playing around with the police. I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, you got to know your history about San Quentin. Like, I'm like, if you ask me, San Quentin is a curse. I'm like, you know, George Jackson died up here. And the CO was like, who's George Jackson? And then the older sergeant guy was downstairs, and he was probably about in his mid-60s. He's like, yeah, George Jackson was in here on the first tier. And then my heart dropped to my stomach. From that time on, I wanted to go to the cell that he was in and just look around and just sit down there and, like, feel the vibe. Like, God, like, you know, it's like me, if you ask me, that's like a museum type. I really feel like, from my point of view, that that cell, no one should be able to move in there. Like, it should be murals of him painted in there. Man, how you know all this stuff, man? I mean, I know my history. That's what's up. You got to know your history. But if you look from 50 years ago to right now, so if you go from 1971 to 2021, and you peep and understand that, like Tupac said, some things will never change. That's just the way it is, man. Okay, we're almost at the end of the episode. This is where we give credit where credit is due. And then we usually hear Lieutenant Robinson's approval at the end. But for this episode, we thought Lieutenant Robinson might have more to say than usual. And not just because he's in it, but because given the weight that George Jackson still has inside San Quentin, he may have more to say. Also, we were just a little nervous that he might not like what we've done. You were nervous, Nigel, not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be honest. (laughs) I was nervous. So let's just get it over with and hear what he has to say now. Yeah, this is a different episode. This is an episode where I can't necessarily say that I, I like it or not, right? Um, I do give my approval to it, but I definitely can't say that I like it. Uh, this event still has relevance, still has weight 50 years later. I think the one thing that's missing from this episode is really the voices from the staff who worked in the facility, uh, who were at San Quentin that day, Dick Nelson, uh, who passed prior to the development of this episode, he was, he had agreed to lend his voice to it. Dick Nelson saved countless lives. And um, it's unfortunate that his voice wasn't there. Um, It's unfortunate that other survivors of that event, their voices were included in this. Um, It's not because of, not because of you guys' efforts. But 50 years is a long time, and those voices pass away, and others don't have the energy to lend that voice. So I don't know how to conclude an episode when you deal with such a topic that's as weighty as people not returning to their loved ones. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson. I am the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison. And again, I approve this episode. This episode was produced by me, Nigel Poor, Erlon Woods, Rasan New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, Amy Standen, and Bruce Wallace. It was sound designed and engineered by Antoine Williams, with music by Antoine, David Jossi, and Rashid Zinneman. Shebnam Sigman is our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. And you know what else is cool about this one, Erlon? Tell me. We brought in our old editor and friend, Curtis Fox, to help with this episode. Curtis Scissorhand Fox. Yes. Thanks, Curtis. 
Thanks to Nathaniel and Claude at the Freedom Archives of San Francisco. They helped us throughout the project and provided the archival audio of George Jackson speaking. They also put together a cool project for this 50th anniversary, focused on the books that George Jackson had in his cell. Find that at freedomarchives.org. Ear Hustle would like to thank Acting Warden Ron Broomfield. And mm, it feels strange to not be tossing to Sam here. You want me to do Sam? <laughs> I think we got him earlier. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Some of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The whole Ear Hustle team at PRX's Radiotopia and Snappers. In addition to the new season of Ear Hustle, we've got big, big news. Drum roll, please. Because the Ear Hustle squad is dropping a brand new book called This is Ear Hustle, Unflinching Stories of Everyday Prison Life. It drops in just a few short weeks, and I know it's going to be fire, featuring brand new stories never before heard on the show. You can pre-order it right now at your preferred provider. That's what I did. The audiobook is on order, Nigel and Erlon, because I miss your voices and because pre-orders count bigly in getting the word out. Collectively, Snap Nation, we're going to snapify the publishing world. Are you with me? Are you with me? Of course you are. And you can subscribe to all things Ear Hustle at EarHustleSQ.com. You best believe that even though this is not the news, this is PRX. Mm-hmm.